And I am so pleased to have here Mike Farah, the producer of this wonderful film. Yeah. And Victor Rubin, who's with the organization Policy Link, who is, which is good, you know it. I mean, it's a place I'm going to these days because they've got all the data and amazing toolkits to work on everything from reforming the police to building communities that are free from displacement and the kinds of things we're seeing in this film. And also, I'm very honored to have uh, Lely Davari Beaton, who's with Ben the Ark, which is, yeah, you know Ben the Ark. If you don't know, you're gonna wanna get with what she's putting out because it is the Jewish social issue, social justice group dealing with issues in the United States and really all the issues we saw in this film. So I'm gonna um, pose a couple of, just a couple of questions to the panelists up here and then open it up for you all. And judging from my reaction to the film and yours, I think the first question has to be, what happened to Rosa? How's she doing? And um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you can take off from that to talk to about some of the issues in the films and, and what is happening to people. Good. When you, uh, when you meet Rosa, she was one of those people that we met uh, we threw a pizza party and invited a bunch of children to come and talk to us. And you knew in an instant that this uh, young girl was such a bright light uh, that she was going to be an amazing character in the story and that she's going to be uh, okay in any situation she's presented. Now, she really did feel strongly about wanting to go to Avenues. And as you read, she was not accepted. Uh, and a lot of people were uh, who've seen the film have been heartbroken by that. They really feel that... Um, she should have been accepted. And it was tough for us in the beginning because, um, you know, we wanted avenues to change a little bit from when we started this movie. Uh, they had committed to let people into this uh, school, and they hadn't let anybody into the school. They had offered some kids from the projects a half scholarship, which, as many of you know, that would, uh, that's a ridiculous uh, argument. But to Avenue's credit, they did let us into their school. They opened up and uh, let us explore uh, their lives. And there have been changes uh, uh, that we've seen at the school um, that have been relayed to us by Jasmine and Isabella uh, have uh, portrayed, uh, told us how uh, positive changes happened after this film was shown. So Rose is amazing. We still see her. My son Finn and I see her in the park uh, all the time. And she's, uh, she's just a very joyous young girl. Um. Victor and uh, Laylee, I'd love to, before we go out into all the broader issues, but maybe this is a way of going there as well, I'd love to hear how each of you relates to the film, um, tied in with the work that you do and that your organization does, and, and tied in with your own personal story, if you feel like going there. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to think about it and talk about the remarkable movie. I had been walking on the High Line in May, we have an office in New York, and I'd been back there for meetings. It's the first time I'd seen it. I had grown up on the Upper West Side. Chelsea is the Lower West Side. And uh, the film leaves me with a probably misguided but very real sense of nostalgia for New York 40, 50 years ago, where there was a real middle class, and I was part of it. My parents had been divorced when I was 10, and my mother was a became a social worker, but we lived on the Upper West Side, went to public schools, used the settlement house up there, Goddard Riverside, public dental clinics, public libraries, so a sense of a middle and a moderate income group and, so, you know, and, rent and subsidized housing that isn't there anymore. So this gap between the rich and poor that the movie describes so artfully reminds me that there's nothing inevitable about that. That's all the result of choices that we make individually and collectively, and policy choices and, and political choices that we can get into as we get along. But you know, I, was, I grew up in a secular Jewish household. My mother's, was, my mother's activism, whether it was feminism or, or world peace or, or the reform clubs on the Upper West Side, she wouldn't attribute it to Judaism because she was a staunch humanist and atheist, but 
the principles were exactly the same as the tikkun olam that we talk about here. So that's where it all started for me, and it's, it's very moving to look at this with that in mind, because that New York doesn't exist anymore. Lely? Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Um, for me personally, this film speaks to me as I experienced first-handedly class divide where I grew up in Texas, right on the border with Mexico, and being half Mexican, um, experiencing what it was like to grow up in a neighborhood where, because of where I lived, um, not having the quality education that I, that I would have liked to have received. Um, so it's the reason why I do the work that I do. Um, I've experienced firsthand through organizing um, how ordinary people become leaders to, um, to change our circumstances, to actually influence the policy and the politics that actually influence their, their circumstances. So that's the reason why I'm here as an organizer, and, and I encourage everyone to take action tonight. Um, if anything, if this film has done anything, it's not enough to talk about these issues, to watch the film, um, but if these stories actually agitate any one of us here tonight, um, I encourage you to transform this agitation into action, whether that be through us, through organizing, through Bend the Arc, or the many organizations that exist here in the Bay Area. I just encourage us all to take action. Um, and I will end with a quote from Abraham Joshua Heschel by, um, if I can paraphrase him, the Jew, the, the Jew takes a leap of action, not a leap of faith. And so I encourage you all this evening to take action. Thank you. Wow, I love that, and I've just got to put you on the spot some more, oh. both about your Jewishness. I've never heard that quote before. I love that. Um, both about, um, yeah, your Jewishness and also maybe some ideas um, for action sure. for the group. Sure, absolutely. Um, oh, and one thing, hold yeah. the mic really close to your um, mouth. Okay, thank you. Um, so my Jewishness, basically, I am a Jew by choice, and ultimately I... I was impressed by the social justice values of Judaism, of progressive Judaism, and what called me to, um, to make the decision. Um, though I have some Jewish roots on my father's side, I was not raised Jewish at all. And so it's connecting to why I do the work that I do. I've seen, I've seen firsthand the, um, the organizing, the advocacy on behalf of progressive Jews, and it's something that speaks very dear to me. And the second question? The second was just some ideas for action. Oh, absolutely, yes. So, of course, I will hear, I will, I will be, um, I'm biased here. So with Ben the Ark, a Jewish partnership for justice, um, we organize and advocate on criminal justice reform, um, racial justice, as well as any progressive taxation. So um, right now the focus is a legislative bill in the assembly right now that would limit solitary confinement for juveniles. Um, and I encourage you all to, um, talk with me afterwards. I can actually tell you how you can make a difference in contacting your assembly members to make sure they support um, this bill. Yeah, we have some handouts you'll see as you're going out. You look at the tables that have a lot of really good ideas for action. And um, now I'd like to open up the floor uh, for questions if our microphone people can circulate. And we'll share these up here. First question is down in front over here. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm of course haunted by what happened to Luke. I'm curious also about the resignation of the, the chair of the board. So I have a bunch of why questions sure. for you. Uh, it's a common question. So with Chris Whittle, I'll talk about Chris first. We don't really know why uh, Chris left or was asked to leave. We're not really sure of the history of that. Um, we were just kind of found out and we haven't been able to find out since. And um, so we haven't dug much deeper on it and we kind of left it to the school to inform us about uh, what Chris Whittle is doing now or why he was let go. Um, regarding Luke, it was uh, absolutely heartbreaking to hear uh, Luke's story. Um, and it was very difficult. Uh, for us to decide how to include that into the film, if we should include it in the film, and how do we handle it uh, at all. Um, when when um, we had shot and found out we had not signed, we did not have a release uh, from Luke. We had given Luke a release and he had his parents, uh, gave it to his parents and then, um, sorry, 
sorry. We did not have a release from Luke's parents. And, uh, and we didn't know if we were going to be able to use it at all. And then um, Luke's mother sent it in to us. Uh, and she's found um, some closure in watching the film. And I think it, uh, she's seen it three or four times. And I think it's, uh, it's helped her a little bit, but it was very difficult for many of the students, and we don't have a lot of uh, other details about it. Is there any other question you have about it? No, we don't know. I think that's a question for avenues about why they would not accept er, er, her at that school. I think... Um, you know, many times people will interview kids and feel that that is not the right school for them. Um, but I'm not going to put words into their mouth. I would, uh, but I, I, I think there's many reasons for it, but I don't know them. Excuse me. I'm going to just give someone else a chance to ask a question. Do we have another one? Yes, a uh, question right here in the front. Oh, that was the next question. Okay. okay. Another one? We'll go back over to your left. Thank you for that film. I think it was the most incredible moving film I've seen in ages. I'm a school teacher and I've dealt, uh, except for two years of a 25 year career with extremely poor kids of all different backgrounds, mostly Hispanic. And I don't know that they really want these kids. Um, the only action I could see that would determine that is if people would fund it, to fund the scholarships 100%. I think that's very possible. Here in this city, there's a school called Urban School, and I got to know kids very well there. And they had such an identical background. I heard them talking about how lucky they were and how they knew that they came from such affluence, but they have a school that truly does give scholarships. And if they're able to pull it off, this place could too, if they wanted to. So I think the action of all of us would be to support financially a scholarship committee. And then once we raise the funds, if they don't take these kids, then it's an issue that they don't want them. May I respond to that? Yes. Yes, um, please. I will. I will uh, actually push back on that. And um, in my experience in in LA, I was working for a few years actually in education reform, and I worked firsthandedly in South Central and the Watts area in housing projects. And through my experience in organizing parents, um, where a lot of parents would make the sacrifice of waking up hours before school started busing their kids across to the valley, for those of you familiar with LA, um, just so their kids could get a better education. And this whole idea of private schooling and scholarships, um, it's been my experience that that's actually not a sustainable method. It's not the right approach. Um, I, though there's good intentions behind it, I think there are great intentions, but I think, and that just comes with more experience in the education reform, um, I think actually it's about the quality of public schools and making sure that all, that, um, that all schools, no matter what the zip code is, where they're located near the housing projects or in the or any any neighborhood, um, that they're actually quality schools um, funded and supported by the district and state and families. So thank you. I'm happy to this is a great dialogue. Anyone else want to stir it up? Another question. You know, we're, right here. We're, uh, just a note that we're in a city, San Francisco, where 34 percent of the school-aged children are in private schools. 34. The, National average is about 15. And there aren't that many kids left in San Francisco overall. But the issues of trying to maintain and, and gain quality in public education are, are far, far bigger than can be fixed by um, broader admissions to elite private schools. There, there are a million, uh, not a million, but there's a whole set of policy actions that people are trying to take to make the best use of what's called the local control funding formula, which began last year, which is a, some opportunity to equalize or come closer to equalizing 
the money that's spent on low-income neighborhood schools compared to others and to compensate for the disadvantages and get teachers of equal experience and other things of that sort. And one other, one other uh, reference or plug, if you will, a lot of the issues faced by the young people you saw there are just about whether they can stay in school, whether they're pushed out, whether the suspension policies are unreasonable, whether there are uh, discipline policies that make sense. And if you look on our website at Policy Link for something called the California Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, you'll see a whole set of state legislation designed to modernize and humanize and make more sensible the uh, discipline policies and a lot of the opportunities that could be made in public schools to keep them from being pushing out the students that need them the most. We can go into that more if you like, but just a, a reminder. And it's not to say that access to private schools would be unimportant, but it's not going to get at 1% of the issues that we have to deal with. I want to say a few things about education in my experience as well. You know, there's a, in New York City, there's a million kids that go to public school in New York City. And the state of New York is spending more than twice as much as the state of California per capita as far as the state uh, that goes. So we need to get the state of California to spend more on public education if we're going to close the divide that exists uh, among our children. Part of my responsibility, I felt, as a gentrifier and moving to New York and moving into Chelsea, was to send my kids to public school. And that was different than my own background here in San Francisco. But I felt, going into a neighborhood for the first time, that uh, I had to become part of the community and understand what that meant. Now, our school is also experiencing hypergentrification. You know, when I first went to PS11, we were raising $50,000 a year, and that was six years ago. And last year, we raised close to a million dollars in our PTA. So you see the changes that have happened in Chelsea. Also, one last thing. When I started it, uh, at PS11 in New York, 70% of the kids in our school in West Chelsea were on free lunch. And that number now is 29% in five years. So you can see the dramatic changes that have happened, even in public schools, uh, uh, about uh, in, in New York City. So. This, that's really fascinating. Um, another question. A uh, comment and then a question. The film does not discuss the reasons for gentrification. There's another film that I've seen whose title I cannot, uh, whose title I can't recall, but it examines the reason why gentrification. This didn't, gentrification did not happen in a vacuum. Uh, my recollection of the thesis of the film was that real estate interests that basically bought New York politicians to get them to allow them to do about anything they want to do anywhere in the city. And that's been a major cause of the decrease in affordable housing in New York City. And my question is, are there any studies or reports about whether uh, these buildings that are being built in Chelsea would have been built in any case if Highline had not been uh, built? You know, there are a lot of different, I'll get started on some of this. I, I don't know if we can answer the specific question, but you know, it, it, the irony is, of course, that there's a lot of progressive advocates for urban parks, and one of the things they love to, um, to uh, make people aware of is that good parks do increase property values. And so take out the extreme case of the High Line and just look at Philadelphia or look at San Francisco or many other cities and you'll see that it's a, there is a, an economic advantage to having a good urban public park and public space. Now, there's no doubt whatsoever that the High Line was a catalyst, but the Bloomberg administration was making high density, high income housing on waterfront areas throughout New York the cornerstone of its rezoning strategy. And the inclusionary component of that was supposed to accommodate the growth boom that resulted when areas like the Far West Side and all along the East River and Brooklyn and Queens and many other places, former industrial areas were made available for housing. So um, sure, real estate developers have always had enormous influence in New York and nothing's really changed in that way. But the idea was that there would be enough inclusionary zoning or enough in-lieu payments for other 
housing to make up the difference. It clearly hasn't. It's also led, frankly, and our friends at Pratt Institute in New York get into this in detail, to the loss of a lot of important industrial land that could have been repurposed for working class advanced manufacturing jobs and instead has gone to luxury housing. So there's a lot of other angles to this. There are a lot of parallels to the South of Market and other neighborhoods in San Francisco. Um, so there's a little bit of every part of this. I'd, if you want to see where the gentrification is happening in the Bay Area and learn a little more about what's behind it, I'd recommend a website called the Urban Displacement project.org out of UC Berkeley. We were just talking with the authors of that today. Okay, so now we're going to keep going with this conversation, but just move it out into the lobby um, because they've got, um, because we want to keep going with the conversation. We're all going to be out in the lobby. Please come out and join us out there and let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. <laughs>